starting the session on telemedicine. So I am Dr. Manoj Mathur, his Dr. Sabisachi Patinayak, then Dr. Kim Ramaswamy and Dr. Natarajan will be joining us soon. So we will be talking to you about telemedicine in ophthalmology. At the outset, I will speak about government guidelines for telemedicine, then we'll take the subject forward. So, at the outset, the background, what, is the, what are the benefits of telemedicine? Timely access to appropriate optimal interventions, faster access to services that may not be otherwise be available, saving of effort and inconvenience, especially for rural patients as they need not travel long distances, financial costs associated with travel would be reduced, telemedicine can play a particularly important role, especially for regular routine checkups and continuous monitoring, the, with telemedicine, maintenance of records and documentation is inherent, and then last but not the least, written documentation increases the legal protection for both the parties. What is the current status, the existing provisions under which the Indian Medical Council Act and the various acts were, were governing the medical profession. These acts primarily govern the practice of medicine and information technology, but gray areas and gaps in legislation and the uncertainty of rules pose a risk for both the doctors and their patients. The onset of COVID-19 pandemic impaired the quality of life of the population. With all the norms of COVID uh, restrictions, compliance of this had an adverse impact, and this reduced the standard of OPD care was deferred, only emergencies were being attended, financial distress to low middle class population was felt, and then the, there was disruption of transport services. And with all these impediments, the government in its commitment to provide equal access to quality of care to all, and also government, uh, government legalize the mainstreaming of telemedicine in health systems to minimize max inequity and barriers to access. So for all this, there was a watershed moment on 5th March 2020 when through a public notice, uh, the MCI notified the telemedicine practice guidelines that were incorporated as an amendment in the Indian Medical Council Regulations 2002 by adding Regulation 3.8 title consultation by telemedicine in the set regulations. The telemedicine practice guidelines were included as Appendix 5. So basically what they did, they defined as per the World Health Organization definition of telemedicine, the definition of RMP. I won't be going into every aspect because it will be a long presentation. I have to present it in about 10 minutes. So let us avoid these definitions. They defined what, the, what is telemedicine, what is an RMP, and then definition of telehealth basically. In general, what we need to understand is that telemedicine is used to denote clinical service delivered by a registered medical practitioner while telehealth is a broader term of use for technology, for health and health related services including telemedicine. What they also specified is a mandatory online course on telemedicine and then they wanted to present a protocol for uh, the telemedicine course that the governments, ha the doctors had to do to officially practice telemedicine and in the interim they gave relief and enabled all the doctors to practice telemedicine till they formulated the guidelines and yet still now we are nearing the end of COVID hopefully but still this course has not been notified and we are waiting for it. Basically, the guidelines for telemedicine in India, the professional judgment of the RMP should be the guiding principle for all telemedicine consultations. An RMP is well positioned to decide whether a technology-based consultation is sufficient or an in-person review is needed. No compromise in the quality of care is 
uh, acceptable. The seven elements need to be considered before beginning any telemedicine uh, consultation. So basically, the seven important com uh, components of telemedicine are number one, the context. Number two, the identification of an RMP and patient. Number three, the mode of communication. Number four, con involves the consent. Number five, the type of consultation. Number six, about the patient evaluation. And last but not the least, the patient management. So coming to the context, the RMP should exercise the professional judgment to decide whether a telemedicine consultation is appropriate in a given situation or an in-person consultation. They should explore all viable options and uh, so they are available and their adequacy for a diagnosis. And uh, what is expected of the RMP is whatever he does, the RMP should shall uphold the same standard of care as an in-person consultation, but within intrinsic limits of telemedicine. What it implies is, you cannot say that I have treated you on telemedicine, but I am not liable to any treatment. You are responsible for the treatment that you offer to the patient, and the patient is at liberty to question you if you go wrong anywhere. So. With that caveat, you are expected to practice and utilize all resources at your disposal and offer telemedicine to the patient. Then there is nothing like anonymous consultation. The identity of the patient uh, identification is very important. This is guideline context number two. The identification of patient, the RMP should verify the and confirm the patient's identity by name, age, address, email ID or whatever, uh, registered ID as appropriate and ensure that there is a mechanism for the patient to verify the credentials and contact details of the RAP. Both ways, the identification is important in the interest of the patient as well as the RMP. Number three, the mode of communication. What are the possible mode of communications in telemedicine? The multiple technologies can be used to deliver telemedicine consultations. Primarily, there are three modes, video, audio, or text. Text means chat, images, messaging, email, fax, etc. There may be situations where in order to reach a diagnosis and to understand the context better, a real-time consultation may be preferable over an asynchronous exchange of information. Regarding the consent, the patient consent is necessary for any telemedicine consultation. The consent can be implied or explicit. Implied consent means that if the patient initiates the telemedicine consultation, then the consent is implied. You are interested, you want to consult me, that's why you are telephoning me. On the other end of the spectrum, explicit patient consent is needed if a health worker, RMP, or a caregiver initiates a telemedicine consultation. My assistant gets in touch with the patient, gets with the, in touch with the assistant, then I, uh, he informs me and schedules an appointment for me. I call up the patient for a teleconsultation. In that case, it is bounded on me to take an explicit consent from the patient and then start the consultation. If the patient directly telephones me and starts the consultation, that is, means that it is an implied consent. Whereas if through some channel, if the doctor is contacting the patient and starting the consultation, then the importance of consent lies. You have to take an explicit consent of the patient. Then about the patient information, if it is bounded on us to gather sufficient information be be before making any professional judgment. And uh, we have to use all our professional discretion to gather the type of information from the patient or advise any further uh, the investigations to the patient. Or if the RMP feels that the information receives is inadequate, then he can request for additional information in real time or shared via email, text, as per the nature of such information. For example, an RMP may advise some laboratory or radiological test to the patient. Then the patient information, again, it, the tele, as we all know, telemedicine has its own set of limitations. If the physical examination is critical, uh, the information for consultation, then RMP should not proceed until a physical examination can be arranged because, as I told you, you cannot take cover that the consultation was on telemedicine and get away because information required may vary from our one RMP to the other based on his her professional experience and discretion and for different medical conditions based on the defined clinical standards and standard of treatment guidelines. 
then what do you mean by the first consultation and follow-up consultation? The government has uh, defined this. First consult means that the patient is consulting the RMP for the first time, or if the patient has consulted the RMP earlier, but more than six months have elapsed, or and number three, if the patient has consulted with the RMP earlier, but for a different health condition, then also it constitutes as a first consult. Follow-up means that the patient is consulting the patient of uh, the same RMP within six months of his or previous in-person consultation and this for the continuation of care for the same health condition. However, it not be considered a follow-up if there are new symptoms that are not in the spectrum of the same health condition as earlier and the RMP does not recall. I don't remember you, I don't recall, then again it is considered as a first consultation. The regarding the patient management, the last uh, aspect about uh, telemedicine guidelines by the government, if the condition can be appropriately managed via telemedicine based on the type of consultation, then the RMP may proceed with his professional judgment to, number one, what are the possible management guidelines for the RMP? can provide health education as appropriate in the case. Like if the patient asks for it, I am a diabetic, I am having weakness, I want to consult you, I want some guidelines. You can counsel the patient by telemedicine, you can advise the patient as to the various uh, possible uh, changes that he can make in the lifestyle or provide counseling related to specific clinical condition or prescribed medication. So basically health education is not an uh, issue. Counseling the patient about a particular disease is also not an issue based on a verbal a video or a verbal communication. The RMP can counsel or give any uh, health education tips to the patient, but the caveat comes, the important thing comes when you're prescribing medicines, prescribing medications where telemedicine consultation is at the professional discretion of the RMP. It entails the same professional accountability. Again, uh, again and again I am saying this, it entails the same professional accountability as in the traditional in-person person consult. If the medical condition requires a particular protocol to diagnose and prescribe as in the case of an in-person consult, then the same pre principle will be applicable for telemedicine consult. So prescribing medications without an appropriate diagnosis or provisional diagnosis will account to a professional misconduct. You may be sitting in the clinic if a patient comes, I am having a red eye without writing the possible provisional diagnosis or diagnosis, you can write to prescribe an antibiotic ointment or an antibiotic eye drop. But in telemedicine, the prescription is considered invalid without a proper diagnosis or a provisional diagnosis. You have to mention your all your credentials or your qualifications because telehealth, telemedicine involves a explicit and implicit consent between the patient and the doctor. All these things are imp important whenever you are advising or prescribing medication to the patient or it may, uh, if you don't do this, it may amount to a professional misconduct. Whereas when you are prescribing medication, there are specific restrictions, limitations on prescribing medicines. You can't prescribe everything on consult via telemedicine depending on the type of consultation and the mode of consultation. The categories of medicines that can be prescribed via teleconsultation will be notified in consultation with the central government from time to time. As of now, what the government did is they notified medicines in three categories, list O, list A, list B, and then the prohibited list. What is list O? It can be prescribed through any mode of consultation, like it will comprise those medicines which are safe to be prescribed, something like an OTC medical counter in the uh, US or in the Western world. Medicines which are used for common conditions, often available over-the-counter medicines, for instance, these medicines would include paracetamol, ORS solutions, cough lozenges, which, are, which can be safely prescribed. These are listed in list O. List A means these medicines at are those which can be prescribed during the first consult, which is the video consultation, and are being re-prescribed or refill in the case follow-up. The first consultation needs to be a video consultation, and subsequently when the patient is following up with the consultation, you to continue the prescription that you have already prescribed, these drugs are the, uh, listed as list A. List B medicine is a list of medication which RMP can prescribe in a patient who is undergoing follow-up consultation in addition to those which have been prescribed during the in-person consult for the same medical condition. So these medicines are listed as list B, whereas the prohibited list an RMP providing consultation via telemedicine cannot prescribe medicines in this list. These medicines have a high potential of abuse and could harm the patient or the society at large if used improperly. Medicines listed in the Schedule Act 
acts of the, the Drug and Cosmetic Act and rules or any na narcotic or psychotropic substances listed in the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act of 1985 cannot be prescribed over telemedicine. So this is a chart. It uh, lists everything, list O drug, list A drug, list B drug and prohibited drugs. What can be prescribed, what cannot be prescribed, you have to follow these guidelines of the government. And as I said, the, the issue of prescription and transmission, the RMP has prescribed the medicines, RMP shall issue a prescription as per the IMC regulations and shall not contravene the provisions of the Drugs and Cosmetic Acts and Rule. That means your title, your name, your, uh, your degrees and everything has to be mentioned, has to be registered, uh, has to be uh, seen in your prescription and if the pay in case the RMP is transmitting the prescription directly to the pharmacy he she must ensure explicit consent of the patient that entitles him her to get the medicines dispensed from any pharmacy of his her choice so they have introduced all these caveats suppose if I am transmitting my prescription to a pharmacy and ask the patient to go and pick up from the pharmacy the patient is at, is at his liberty whether to take the medicines from the same pharmacy or demand a prescription and go to a pharmacy of his choice. This also the government has specified. Thank you for your patient hearing. So all these seven points we need to know and uh, what are the government guidelines. The government is still lacking. We are coming cl to a close of uh, COVID this thing but still they said they will uh, notify a mandatory course on telemedicine but we are still awaiting. Till that time we are all permitted to practice telemedicine subject to the conditions that we follow all these seven principles. So with that On yeah, this guideline, we are very fortunate that during this COVID, Government of India came out with these guidelines. So prior yeah. to that guideline, any teleconsultation was not considered as legal. Legal, yeah. So this now is one thing. The yes. second thing is with these guidelines, what they have imposed is, it should be considered as a physical consultation. Consent is a must. Then documentation has to be there. Many a times we do uh, teleconsultation, somebody nearer to you or close to us asks over telephone, I have this problem, this problem, what to do for our consultation. But in that particular case now, whoever, however close he might be, what we have to do is we have to ask him to send a photograph first because the decision to have a teleconsultation or tele-advice entirely depends upon the physician, all of us. Whether this can be done or managed through telemode or a physical examination is needed. So that is the first thing as per these guidelines also. Yeah. So by getting a photograph, then you can decide with this condition whether you can continue teleconsultation or will advise them for a physical consultation. Yeah. The RMP has to exercise discretion as to whether telemedicine, teleconsultation is enough or not. So as he said, number one, the consent, number two, the number one, the context, number two, the consent of the patient, number three, his preliminary thing you can ask the patient to send a photograph of the condition and if you are confident that you can proceed by telemedicine then only initiate a tele proper telemedical consultation and tr try to manage the patient so with that we move on to the next topic objectives and perspectives of TOSI TOSI is teleophthalmological society of India that was founded last year and uh, we have got a legal standing now we have registered the society and uh, the aims and objects of the society will be uh, Dr. Sabhisaji Patnaik will be speaking on behalf of Dr. BNR Subuddhi, who was to speak on this topic earlier, but uh, he had to leave for his hometown yesterday. Dr. Sabhisaji. I, I will start with my topic first and then I will okay. come to tell you something. Okay, so in that case, we are now. So, Sabhisachi will be continuing with my presentation. I have spoken to you about the teleophthalmology guidelines and now Dr. Sabhisachi will speak to you as to how to organize and start teleconsultation. So, thank you very much, sir. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you regarding a subject or a method of consultation which all of us are doing in some way or other. But that we have to put it in a proper perspective. Because COVID has taught us many things. You, s you could see that we can reduce our patient load in the OPD by 30% by using certain other methods other than the conventional method that we are used to. So mostly tele is, I don't have any financial involvement in this. So basically there are three types of teleconsultation. One is the real time or the synchronous teleconsultation, one to one. 
so people believe that this is the only form of teleconsultation and second is a store and forward telemedicine technique images can be taken and sent to a remote consultant who will review that and ultimately advise and guide the patient so mostly our uh, our specialty ophthalmology is basically image based specialty so this suits all to our profession very well so many of the screening programs diabetic uh, retinopathy screening and glaucoma screening program have been initiated with this model of store and forward or ask synchronous manner another method is the remote patient monitoring suppose we are following up a patient for the long for long time particularly for chronic diseases then we can review his health data as on today and can advise properly using tele network so these are the possibilities or options we have as ophthalmologist we can have a mobile clinic somewhere else and sitting our in our clinic at the headquarter we can advise them what to do how to follow up patients we can conduct screening camps as i have told you this is the very very popular mode of tele ophthalmology use in our country you can have home opd system also patient can send his image and you can decide or also you can have a one to one discussion synchronous mode of uh, developing tele system you can have vision centers where we will have a trained person like a uh, ophthalmic assistant or a vision technician who will assist the person and who will take the preliminary data and figures that we can also use for advising properly to the patient the patient doesn't have to come to the hospital all the time optician service and other diagnostic services and we can put our there are various methods now available which can be put in gp surface suppose you can put uh, mobile fundus camera in uh, diabetologist clinics there anyone come into that a photograph can be taken and that will be stored and analyzed later on this model all these models are working in our country in different places so basically if we we'll divide our services we can have home opd service e vision center mobile tele ophthalmology camp and we can use it for second opinion these are the four purposes for which we can initiate our tele ophthalmology services for the people so first of all we have to decide the purpose what i am interested in it is not that every ophthalmologist will use all the methods possible because that is not possible so we have to find out from where to start then we can expand our tele ophthalmology services so these are the conditions which we can very well sort out as in home opd services we can also charge for that people can pay also digitally it is not that it is a free community service that we are going to do unless the patient is not able to afford but there are certain conditions when the patient will complain of pain diminution of vision severe photophobia or in case of doubt it is better to ask him for physical consultation avoid giving advice over telephone whoever however close he may be to you because these are the things which will later on create problem medical legal problem for all of us so for setting up a tele ophthalmology program in your practice decide how will you use telemedicine then you have to have a plan what do you want to accomplish with telemedicine you want to reduce your opd load you want to reduce the follow up patient suppose you have done a surgery today and it we are advising weekly and by weekly follow up of those patients whether that is needed the patient has to come to you or can be managed through teleconsultation start with few services then you expand and you have to ensure that patients are aware about the services that you are providing somehow the patients or the public are not well versed with the system so you have to train them what we expect out of them what they should have at least to go for teleconsultation choose proper equipment if you want to have a synchronous mode of teleconsultation then you should have a dual screen lcd monitor internet with high speed good camera and microphone then you have to have a dedicated mobile number for this purpose not that the mobile number that you use for your banking and other social purposes will use for this purpose 
then choose proper telemedicine software or application. This is very important. If you want to have a synchronous mode of thing, then you have to have proper app where you can, the patient can use that. It makes easy for the patient to sign up. Fewer the steps for patients, the more likely things will run smoothly. It has to be convenient to the patient or the person who is going to use. Simplest way for user is to enter through a patient's portal and pick a time. You have to give a time for any synchronous teleconsultation system so that when you are available and the patient will approach you during that time. Then you have to have a proper setup. It should look to the patient that you are very serious about teleconsultation. It is not that leisurely sitting in your drawing room you do this type of consultation. So you should have a de dedicated place for this purpose, as a quiet room, adequate lighting, and you have to perform certain trial runs. For synchronous mode, these are all required. Dress up proper properly as you see patients in the office. Be punctual for teleappointment. Develop a good website manner. And you have to respond to the patient. The patient should feel that he is directly talking to you or consulting to you. Ask questions to encourage them to open up. Maintain eye contact with the patient. So look into the camera of the laptop, not to the screen. So when looking away to consult the record or something else, let the patient know that you are doing something or you are searching for some data or some figures so that he can respond properly. Otherwise, you will think that this doctor is not interested in my problem. So again, patients have to be also prepared initially. They should be informed. There has to be, they have to have proper net connectivity. Their apprehensions has to be removed. This will increase the response and lead to patient satisfaction. E-Sanjeevani portal is now getting popular. It's a government portal for teleconsultation. Those in government service can use this and can start teleconsultation practice. There are app-based tele-examination apps available now for taking vision in home OPD services. There are different charts available to record color vision, field of vision, ampsular chart. Those can be used in home OPD services and accordingly proper advice can be given through telemode. There are also certain advanced features coming up. We are getting good number of handheld instruments which can be used for teleconsultation purposes. So to tackle blindness, the problem of blindness in India, I think apart from physical consultation, we have to develop this remote consultation mode. So what we feel, teleophthalmology can be the only viable option to reach every individual of the country for his eye care. So teleophthalmology can be an effective and feasible model for providing universal eye care and prevention of blindness. Telemedicine initiatives is to strengthen rather than compete with other health services. Need to develop standardized teleophthalmology solutions and user-friendly SOPs. Public awareness and orientation is a must for this program to be successful. So a paradigm shift for ophthalmologists, a whole different way of thinking about ophthalmic care that people were never used to. So my conclusion is let us all get started in some way or other to incorporate this technology into our practice so that ultimately will help the citizens of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabisachi, for that wonderful exposition. I think I will tweak the topics a little bit. Uh, we will take the aims and objects of TOSI at the end. So let us keep the momentum flowing. And I would like to invite Dr. Kim to give his talks about television center and also diabetic retinopathy in telescreening. So after this, uh, we'll, we'll maintain the flow about telemedicine and of the aims and objects of TOSI, we will keep it at the end, Sabisachi. That, that will be good to keep the flow going. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Mathur, for this inviting me to be a part of this tele-ophthalmology session, and which is close to my heart.
Thank you, sir. I'm going to do the two talks, one on the vision centers of the primary care and the other one of Dr. Rajiv Raman's talk, unfortunately, is yeah. not being, sure. yes, being you can called off. one on. after the other. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what is vision centers? You know that we have a, I don't need to tell the ophthalmologist the size of problems that we have in, the, in vision. But the problem is creating access to people in the remote areas, how to reach everyone uh, who needs primary care or uh, in, uh, in eye care. In most developing countries, the proven treatments reach people, only 20% in the urban areas, but it hardly reaches the people in the primary or urban or rural settings. And if you strengthen the primary, the, the, the main problem that we are getting a lot of patients in the tertiary care is because of the failure at the primary care level, when we are not addressing it when it is small, if that can be done, then we can reduce the number of patients coming at the tertiary care level with advanced problems such as diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, or corneal injuries. But how to reach these everyone early on? How do we create? Uh, I just wanted to show you that we used to go to eye camps, do screening, a lot of eye, uh, going into the community with a whole team. But we realized in the late uh, 90s that we were not, in spite of the huge team going into the community, we were still not reaching everybody who need care. Only 7% of those with felt need care were being seen. And the rest were still not being addressed because you are going once in three months or six months into that community. And so you are not addressing the really the entire problem. So that's why we, in 2003-04 we transited partly to the vision centers, creating what we call as uh, primary eye care centers or vision centers. This is for every 50,000 population we set up these vision centers. Today we have about 100 vision centers in the state of Tamil Nadu, where these vision centers are set up where there are no ophthalmologists in a small towns where there's in a connected to the different villages. These are permanent facilities, eye care facilities, a small facility manned by two ophthalmic, one ophthalmic technician and a coordinator uh, who would, uh, and, and that is they, they would do a complete eye examination just like an ophthalmologist would do. And so the idea is to provide eye care and they have connectivity to the base hospital. So it's like a hub and spoke model for every tertiary hospital that we have. We have multiple vision centers connected to them. They, they are like around 50 to 100 kilometers in radius uh, or in the distance from where these patients are seen. So in a, in a typical vision center, uh, what happens is the, the patient gets registered, does a, the ophthalmic technician would do a complete eye examination just like an ophthalmologist would do in a slit lamp do an entire, uh, the exact data is all examined and entered into the uh, an electronic medical records. So they would do an application tonometry, do a fundus photograph as needed. The, this earlier we were using these simple digital cameras, but today we are replacing it with the low cost fundus cameras. And then they connect to the ophthalmologist in the base hospital who would look at the electronic medical records simultaneously, any images uploaded and then they talk to the patient directly to tell them whether they need to, you know, what, what should be done. Either it's, most often it's glasses or irritation, watering, you know, those kind of things. Only 10% of any of these vision centers, we need to refer these patients to the base hospital for any further management. So it's as, uh, it, it really makes a big difference for the people living in these remote areas. People who are not accessing care would access care in these patients. So we would create these patients like, you know, prescribe uh, medicines there. The whole idea is to, even the glasses are dispensed there because the patient need not travel to a city for getting any of these services. Today, we are doing more than about, actually today it's about close to 3,000 patients. Uh, every single day we are doing these teleconsultations across those 100 vision centers. So what is given in this, it's identification of basic primary care well, the, we are able to identify whether the patient has got any refractive errors, whether the patient has got cataract, whether the patient has got glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy. These are screening. I'm telling you, this is screening, not the actual diagnosis. 
but then you are able to do the screening with these uh, help of these uh, ophthalmic technicians and basically especially the stroma for corneal ulcers and stuff we have been able to reduce that so today this is considered the best last mile connectivity in any healthcare intervention because today we are able to access you know even in the remotest area no dependence on the attenders for the patient which normally when they have to come to a hospital they have to bring an attender and time and money saved more importantly compliance to care has improved because they are right there they don't have to go into the city looking for spending the whole day which means it's a loss of wages for the whole day and also having to take somebody with them so this is just to give you the numbers we are also doing this diabetic retinopathy screening uh, i'll talk about this with the, you know we are using artificial intelligence to help these vision center technicians so today this has become a model where the government of tripura this happened in 2007 when they established about 40 vision centers running even today successfully the government of tripura established it we went and set up the whole thing and this is being scaled in multiple states as we speak bangladesh is planning to establish about 400 vision centers today we have uh, helped them to establish about 90 vision centers so what it means is you're really creating access to primary care in these vision centers there's another uh, initiative by rotary club uh, which is creating these what we call as hybrid vision centers they're using mobile vehicles uh, and uh, mobile vans to reach into the community and also a central uh, vision center and these are all having link to one of the tertiary hospitals so what is enabling today this to happen is because of the nationwide broadband availability through the mobile networks and widespread of use of emr but we really like you know the new policies on telemedicine will help in improving this or creating access to care in the remote areas using teleophthalmology so as i said a good primary care system reduces the bulk of the load in the tertiary care so the tertiary care uh, people can focus on really addressing the serious problems that reach out to us so thank you happy any questions i can answer if there are any questions any related questions to this i'm happy to answer yeah. yes sir yes sir for tele ophthalmology so i'm attending this uh, during the corona situation i worked for six months in ophthalmology and rightly have shown the same way i have a peripheral center uh, in bangladesh and dhaka and outside my staffs are there they prepare the patient for everything like auto refractometry intraocular pressure like nct they take the anti segment photograph and if i ask them for the post segment photograph also so if we uh, see all these things, we could diagnose any posture segment problems, any anti segment problems. So I like uh, the way you are doing it in India is really good. And uh, as you mentioned, Bangladesh also, we are trying in government level. Yeah, the government uh, is yeah, establishing yeah. these. Yeah, with Aurobind and other uh, institutes, yes, I sir. think. Yes, so definitely uh, it helps our patient, density population, people, they cannot come to the hospital. So I think not the corona has taught these things, but I think we should continue the whole yes. uh, ophthalmology, teleophthalmology, and uh, actually you have pointed everything, what I wanted to ask, but already have shown everything. I think this is the way to go. Only government should help us, so it is possible. And uh, thank you for continuing this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Professor Islam. <laughs> the, Dr. Kim Ramaswamy will be speaking on the topic, diabetic retinopathy and telescreening on behalf of Dr. Rajiv Raman. So another important uh, topic is the management of diabetic retinopathy, but more importantly, you need to diagnose or screen these patients, bring them. That's one big challenge. Today we have, they, we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. We are not seeing the entire diabetic patients as such. Whatever numbers that are quoted is still 50% uh, 
or undetected diabetes. So which means there's a huge lot of, I mean, a lot of patients that are out there. And you know today that the numbers are increasing very rapidly and it's more so in a country like India. So which means the problem of if they are not identified early on, we are only going to treat patients who have advanced diabetic retinopathy where the results are going to be much poorer. So one and two actually don't know that they need, uh, you know, they have diabetic, diabetes or diabetic retinopathy. So why do we need telescreening? What is the role of telescreening? We all know the urban rural divide. We also know the distribution of ophthalmologists to the number of the, to the population that is out there. And it is not just the retina specialists alone who will do the DR screening. It is the role of every single ophthalmologist and not just ophthalmologists, but many others, other stakeholders who are involved in, uh, you know, managing diabetic patients should be involved in this. So screening for diabetic retinopathy is the key because as we all know, it's a very clear condition which can be diagnosed or screened for based on just fundus images, based on, you know, it's a very clear uh, markers are there to identify these patients. Of course, clinic based when a patient who comes into your clinic is the most effective way when you make a diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy, it's very comprehensive. We continue to do an outreach screening for diabetic retinopathy, just like how we go for comprehensive screening in the community. We work in the community with the local diabetologists or primary care physicians to group these patients and our team would go and identify these. But this is still not enough to, so we work with the local physicians, they screen for diabetes and we screen for diabetic retinopathy. But this is not enough. We need to reach out to much higher, larger population. So what are the dynamics of screening? First is reaching the diabetic. Today we are not doing that because the diabetics with normal vision are not coming to the ophthalmologist. But they go to a, a diabetologist or a primary care physician for their diabetes. They go to the uh, pharmacies to buy the medicines for diabetes. They go to uh, labs to uh, do their blood sugar testing. So these are opportunistic areas where you could do the screening. And then the second part of screen doing that is once identifying the patient, who are the target population, then how do you evaluate these patients for diabetic retinopathy, evaluation of the fundus, and then reporting. Once you have done the fundus examination, how do you report? Who can do the reporting? Whether it's a non-ophthalmologist grader or an ophthalmologist. So telescreening, as I mentioned, is, is definitely a way to move forward to identify these patients in an opportunistic way. Because I said, they are the first point of contact. The primary care physicians or the endocrinologists or diabetologists are the first point of contact. And they can do the screening using telescreening, just like how you do a blood test, a blood examinations. These patients can be screened for, uh, you know, just a fundus examination. They usually do their blood hemoglobin, HbA1c, uh, you know, all that test is being done. One more station is to get their fundus photos done and then the patient uh, gets the eye examined. So this is what I mentioned by fundus images being uh, captured at the, these opportunistically. So we have been doing this for the last 20 years with multiple diabetic clinics or endocrinologist clinics where the patient who's coming there, their fundus photo is taken by the technician, we train their technician and they send an image to through internet to our base hospital where a retina specialist used to look at these images. We developed a software for grading these images. Uh, it's not an AI software, but a semi-automated software where you generate a report and then we send it back to the uh, diabetology clinic within about an hour or two so that the if the patient has any retinopathy, then they are referred to the ophthalmologist for further management. So there are three components to telescreening. One is the hardware, fundus cameras, the software for reporting this, uh, which I mentioned like a semi-automated software that we had for grading. And then the telecommunication that is very essential part of this. So what has changed in the last 10 years? This been, I mean, recently we are all talking about so much about telescreening, especially for diabetic retinopathy. We started with using these VSAT, big mobile 
dish antennas, uh, with the mobile vans, with, thanks to ISRO. We used to go into the community of uh, uh, Shankarnetralia did and Arvind did, but this is all gone now because with our cell phones, the technology has become much better. So we used all possible technologies. We used an extended Wi-Fi from the University of Berkeley where we put antennas to communicate with the different location. Then we do these multiple dongles and then now we have the broadband. So the tele-density is definitely growing in our country. So we have all the opportunity to use this technology. And then, of course, all of you have seen the growth in the cameras that have been coming. They're like, you know, small. We used to look at those big fundus cameras to so many of these cameras. Almost every session you will see somebody talking about these so-called using these small handle fundus cameras or even using these mobile phones for taking fundus pictures. So it has come to that. From this to this, it's become that easy. So those cameras are available. Earlier, we used to shell out 10 lakhs to 12 lakhs to buy a camera. Today, we don't need to do that. So it's very simple. But what is the problem here is to, you take the picture and then who grades these images? Having these trained graders also is not been easier. To get a retina specialty to do that is a waste of time and the time delay that happens in, in this whole grading and all that. And then the inconsistency in grading. You know, between two ophthalmologists, there has been a difference in the grading the same image. One says it's moderate NPDR, the other person says severe NPDR or PDR. So that's a challenge. That's, so we have been working with uh, both Rajiv and myself have been working with the Google Steam since 2013 to work on developing these AI algorithms. And today in Tarwind, we are using this in real time where you just drag and drop an image and then within a minute or less than a minute, this says whether it's a mild, moderate, severe, what, whether the, the image has got diaptic macular edema, to what extent this is present is, comes out as a report. And based on that, you, you advise the patient whether to go see an ophthalmologist or not. An, you know, you can wait for three months and then come back again for a checkup or after six months, or if they have no retinopathy, an annual checkup. So today, we, in our process, which we have been doing for the last two decades, we have replaced it the retina specialist or the grader with the AI tool. So in the last one year, we have been screening about close to 90,000 diabetic patients uh, just using these telescreening, I mean, AI, using these artificial intelligence. We are also going into the, the other, as I said, we don't miss any opportunity to screen these diabetic patients. We worked with the government to go to the primary health center where the diabetic patients would come to buy their medicines or get their medicines once a week. All the diabetic patients in the government PHCs, they would come once a week. So the primary health medical officer will not prescribe the medicine or dispense the medicine unless the patient had his fundus photo or DR screen. So <laughs> this way we are ensuring that every, <coughs> sorry about that, every <coughs> patient gets the uh, DR screening done, that's fine sir, no problem, uh, that's not a problem, thank you. So what we call as opportunity screening, and this is the only way we can screen to all those patients who are in the lower economic group who would not, you know, they with the normal uh, fundus, the, with the normal vision, they are not going to go to the ophthalmologist. So you have to catch them when they have diabetes, all, uh, you know, in an opportunistic way, wherever they come, you screen them, for diabetic retinopathy. But what has not changed? Again, still there is poor awareness about diabetes and the diabetic complications. Many a people, even educated people, however, you tell them that you need, uh, uh, you know, diabetic retinopathy evaluation, but people don't do it because they always say, I can read even the smallest of letters, though I have diabetes for 20 years. They don't want to, uh, this thing. Then also access to care is limited then of course, you know, myths about treatment and the absence of treatment is added to this. So the DR screening challenges, who should do the screening? People think it is the role of ophthalmologist, but I say I've been talking or promoting that the onus of doing the screening should be with the physicians, primary care physicians, endocrinologists, diabetologists, even the labs, wherever it is possible, the, because they are, that is where your target population is going. They're not coming to the ophthalmologist. 
they come to the ophthalmologist only when they have an eye problem so if we could screen these patients using technology we would be going we'll be doing a great uh, you know uh, benefit or uh, uh, favor to the diabetic patients like one of the group in chennai had developed a innovative business model using uh, this dr screening where they would they worked with put fundus cameras in multiple diabetic patient uh, diabetology clinics all over india and they used to screen about 15 to 20000 diabetic patients every single month it was a business model so everybody in this gets to pay and but the benefit is that every diabetic patient is getting screened so the ai algorithms today you have a huge number of ai algorithms that are out there in the market some are certified some are not certified but what it means what i'm trying to tell you is ai is out there to stay not just for diabetic retinopathy it's going to come for glaucoma amd and many other conditions so the onus of finding the dr cases should be with the general physician and diabetologist and the ophthalmologist should work with the physicians in completing the loop for identification it's not enough if you just screen the patient and leave them you have to find ways the diabetologist or the primary care physician finds a case of diabetic retinopathy they should know when to refer the patient and where to refer the patient so we need to complete the loop and use of technology will and ai will play a major role in early identification of these patients thank you again sir for this yeah. thank you dr kim any questions on this topic yes sir yes sir yes sir thank you dr kim i wanted to know that the ai deep learning you are using the statistical data where from you collected from your own hospital the software you made yourself or it taking from outside because uh, because that, that their data may not be equal to the indian yeah this was done on the indian populations as what uh, shankar netralia and arvind did was worked we worked with a google team to develop the yeah. algorithm yeah, yeah. but today we have also noticed that there is no difference in the caucasians versus indian eyes because they all have almost the same mm -hmm. this thing but there have been a lot of validation studies have been done mm -hmm. and before we brought it in real time we did multiple validation studies mm -hmm. before we deployed it in uh, you know in our community a validation study at arvind we did okay. uh, across using different cameras and you know doing all that you mentioned that it is about 90% correct more than 90%, more than 90%, sir. 90%. yes sir yes, i think it is going to stay yeah yeah, yeah definitely it will be the way to screen the patients uh, we move on to the next topic ai in tele of the telemedicine Uh, is, uh, Dr. Natarajan, on behalf of Dr. Natarajan, yeah, please come. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here on the behalf of Padma Shri Professor Dr. S. Natarajan Sir. Since he is busy in his two back-to-back -back sessions, so he gave me this opportunity to present this uh, his topic. So, artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science that aims to answer Turing's question in the affirmative. Now, who is Turing's? Alan Turing's a uh, very famous computer scientist established the fundamental goal and vision of artificial intelligence a machine that thinks like a human types of artificial intelligence narrow artificial intelligence a weak ai like siri google and amazon alexa artificial general intelligence strong ai skynet artificial intelligence enabling machines to think like humans machine learning training machines to get better at a task without explicit programming deep learning using multi-layered networks for machine learning 
In ophthalmology, AI is seen to have unlimited potential to perform many tasks as well as or even much better than humans. It is seen to be very good as diagnostic tool, great the severity of a disease, early disease detection, screening tool, prediction of the evolution of a disease. So here are some publications of artificial intelligence and on OCT imaging, artificial intelligence makes screening faster, more accurate and more accessible and AI and deep learning of ophthalmology. Published, uh, this is a development and validation of deep learning published in JAMA. JAMA. Problems of statement. The problem is with the lack of trained cl clinicians, delay, lost follow-ups, missed or postponed treatments and increased in the probability of vision loss. Uh, diabetic retinopathy screening is an important public health uh, problem. Retinal photography is a validated, simple and effective for DR screening. Challenges. Diabetic retinopathy screening programs are challenged by issues related to implementation, availability uh, or sorry, of human assessors and long-term financial sustainability, sustainability. In order to overcome practical challenges like remote locations, transportation and poverty, there is a need for improvement in the practical aspects of remote ophthalmic diagnosis and care. Recent studies indicate that AI has a uh, astound potential to perform much better than human being in some tasks, especially in the image recognition field. Early detection and appropriate treatment of eye disease are of great significance to prevent vision, vision loss and promote living qualities. Automated techniques of DR diagnosis have been explored to improve the management of patients with DR and alleviate uh, social burden. AI was used to predict DR risk and DR progression among diabetic patients to combat with the worldwide disease. AI-based retinal screening devices. Smartphone-based retinal imaging is an effect efficient and cost-effective method of sc uh, for screening. The device can help in delivering eye care services to unprivileged population group in resource-limited or remote areas. It is an ideal platform for uh, comprehensive telemedicine enabled eye health screening and detailed photo documentation for disease uh, indications such as cataract, glaucoma, vitreous and retinal pathologies. AI has the potential to significantly enhance and uh, impact on screening programs for vision impairment and eye disease and thus to impact on global blindness. Integration of retinal photography and AI. AI-based grading and diagnosis system for referable DR, glaucoma, and age-related macular degeneration cataract performs the following procedure fully automatically, identifies fundus features, classifies image quality, classifies the existence and severity of the disease. Process flow. Screening can be performed using portable equipment, which is easy to set up and effectively examine the eyes. In the screening process, diabetics can assemble in a community setting and technician can transport the screener to a particular location. The retinal image will be acquired using smartphone-based imaging devices by a semi-skilled worker who is specially trained for the same. The image are then graded by AI and a provisional report is generated. Uh, the cases uh, with referable DR can then be referred to an ophthalmologist for further management. AI is based on deep learning technology. It can be used to detect referable case of uh, diabetic retinopathy. Advantages. Um, increase accessibility of screening program. Low resource areas enable, uh, enable non uh, eye trained clinician to conduct opportunistic screening without the need for trained specialists. Saving of the health system for providing more targeted referrals to eye specialist. Real-time reporting of results and referable recommendation. Reduces the patient anxiety, reduces documentation errors, reduces difficulties uh, recontacting patients. Remedio funders on phone can be mounted on suitable bike for transporting for screening purpose. It is a chargeable portability is there, low maintenance and job opportunity. Easy retrieval of data at reading centers. Accountability, proper training of a semi-skilled worker and proper, regular, proper and regular monitoring. Ease of workflow. Easy retrieval of data at reading center. Uploading of diagnosis by retina specialist. Treatment and general advice. Regular intervals, visiting of screening team for follow-up. Expected outcome, early detection and treatment after screening can reduce the 
prevalence of DR even in remote areas, reduction in the economic burden among poor and illiterate people, opportunity for semi-skilled workers also, it uh, will help to improve overall health of the population. Grading by artificial intelligence. The Meteor's AI algorithm uh, is designed to diagnose only referable DR and no diabetic retinopathy and does not grade the stages of DR. Referable DR uh, uh, was defined by the presence of moderate to severe NPTR, PTR and of diabetic macular edema and clinically significant macular edema. Diagnostic accuracy of community based diabetic retinopathy screening with an AI system. This was a prospective cross sectional study took place on August 2018 on Septem to September 2018. Patients with diabetic mellitus uh, who visited various uh, dispensaries uh, administered by the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai uh, on a particular day were in, uh, included, published in JAMA. Uh, known case of DM visiting the municipal dispensaries of uh, Mumbai were included. Fundus images of both the eyes were taken and uploaded and saved on cloud storage space. An ophthalmologist seated, uh, seated in a distant locate, uh, location sees the image and grade the severity of the retinopathy. The AI, uh, the AI incorporated in the cameras was also used to grade if the retinopathy was referable. Advantages. An offline AI algorithm does automated grading of, a retinal, of the retinal images providing the results immediately. Reports can be made readily available to patients even in the remotest location. Advanced image processing capabilities um, moving actually. Diagnostic accuracy of community based diabetic retinopathy screening with an offline AI system on a smartphone. I'll just tell the advantages of AI. Accuracy of the about 90% according to the initial pilots, which improves the original data sets are gathered. Highly scalable process with thick response time, solution is extensible. Emerging healthcare technologies focus on reducing unnecessary visits to medical specialists, minimizing the overall cost of the treatment and optimizing the number of patients seen by each doctor. Disadvantages, uh, negative AI-based finding may give the patients a false sense of security about the totality of uh, their ocular status. Emerging evidence uh, from the Jocelyn Diabetes Center showing that DR lesion in the peripheral retina are highly predictive of which patients will develop proliferative DR, the binding form of the disease. Community DR screening using funders on phone. On uh, 26 January 2019, mega DR screening camp in Dharavi uh, using 13 funders on phone devices organized by Aditya Jyot Foundation. Community bank, uh, community DR screening using funders on phone. 649 diabetic patients were screened. Uh, in Dharavi, using fundas on phone device, 53 were diagnosed to have DR. So, conclusion of AI for screening is accessibility, affordability, and efficiency of the service. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, with these, uh, with this foundation about telemedicine, uh, some founders have decided to to establish a society called Teleophthalmological Society of India, which was founded last year. 
So the aims and objects of TOSI will be enumerated by Dr. Sabya Sachi. This is your last presentation. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, Tele Ophthalmology Society of India was formed on 4th April 2021 during COVID time. So, few of us sat together virtually and decided to form a society considering the application of Tele medicine technology into ophthalmology. So we formed a governing council with Professor Natarajan as the president, Kim sir as the president-elect, then Dr. Rajiv Raman of Sankar Mitralaya as the vice president, Professor V. N. Arsugu the secretary, and Dr. Senthil from Chennai as the joint secretary. And we have few members in, in that, and it was launched on 4th April. So the basic purpose of forming this society was to formulate guidelines to be followed by individual members and the ophthalmologist who will practice tele-ophthalmology. In the line with the national guidelines that are evolving for telemedicine practice. So we have also started conducting online training program with the help of ECO India and we have planned to provide training for all category of eye care services in, tele, in use of teleophthalmology and teleophthalmology technology in their practice. And we want to develop teleophthalmology models as per the need of the practitioners. Also help in procurement of equipment by including industrial members into our society. And also we like to develop software for the use by the members and a video platform for online consultation and mobile apps and other legal issues that are to be handled through the society which will not be possible for the individual practitioner to go through. So we have different types of membership, founder member, then life members, any ophthalmologist, desirous of betterment of tele ophthalmology services into his practice can be a member. We can have associate member without any postgraduate training in ophthalmology. What desires of betterment of society and use of telemedicine services can be a member. Industrial members, as I have told you, will encourage them to be part of this society so that you can take their help. And honorary member, overseas life member, honorary institutional member, and institutional member. These are the types of members that we have decided to have in our society. So what we have kept is the admission fees of 1,000 rupees and life membership of 5,000 rupees for individual ophthalmologist to be member of the society. So this is our contact number, email and website. So by using this website, you can be a member. So I request all of you who are present here and interested in teleophthalmology to be a member of the society so that we can collectively discuss and take decisions for the betterment of the society by using teletechnology for the service of all of us. Thank you very much. With that, we come to the end of the didactic session. Any questions or any clarifications, anything, we will be able to answer you. Yeah. Okay. Then, thank you all for attending this session.